Welcome everyone. I'm John Solomon, Editorial Director of the Aspen Institute Sports and Society Program. And welcome to the future of sports. W women reimagining pro sports. This is our bi-monthly conversation series where we explore big emerging ideas in sports, always with an eye towards solutions that help sports serve the public interest, which is the mission of our program. First, a big thank you to Axio Sports, our media partner on the Future of Sports series. The Axio Sports Daily Newsletter is one of the very best out there, always put into the context what the sports stories of our time mean, not only today, but into the future. You can subscribe to the Axios newsletter by visiting sports.axios.com. Near the end of today's conversation, Axios sports editor Kendall Baker will be moderating our audience Q&A. If you have a question for any of the speakers, please submit it in the Q&A function on Zoom, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Today's conversation is on the future of professional sports if reimagined by women. Historically, positions of leadership and power in pro sports and organized sports in general have been occupied by men. Essentially, the history of sports has been framed around the history of man's involvement in sports. Men have designed the competition formats, the way athletes are treated, the storytelling themes that get elevated, and the cultural conversations around the value of sports and their intersection with critical issues in society. Women, for the most part, simply inherited these sports models and tried to build upon them. So what if pro sports were owned, designed, and run by women? How might the experiences change or stay the same? That's what we'll explore today. The reality is we don't have to totally reimagine a world in which women are rethinking sports. It's already happening. The success of the National Women's Soccer League has been driven by a female commissioner with female celebrities as, as investors, including A-list Hollywood actresses world-class athletes, and former first family members. Female athletes have brought the WNBA to new heights by leading the way on racial justice themes in sports. For the first time, a former WNBA player, Renee Montgomery, has become both an owner and an executive of a WNBA franchise. New women's professional softball, volleyball, and lacrosse leagues launched by Athletes Unlimited look nothing like traditional men's leagues. The league's focus is on individual players with no head coaches, no club owners, and no set rosters. The players draft their own teams and develop their own game and marketing strategies. Our conversation today isn't happening in a vacuum. The US sports industry faces major disruptions due to the financial impact of COVID-19, changing technology, declining interest by younger generations to watch sports, and increasing awareness of the disparities between men's and women's sports. We know the advantages of women being in position of power. A 2019 study found that public companies with women CEOs or CFOs often were more profitable and produced better stock prices than companies with men. During the first quarter of 2021, 41 women led Fortune 500 companies. That's just 8%, still a small number, but it's an improvement from 5% in 2018 and less than 1% from 20 years ago. So what if we could start sports over again today, only this time led by women? What would sports look like? So to explore those questions today, we're really pleased to have three terrific panelists, all of whom are in different stages of their careers in sports. Julie Foudy is a key member of the ownership team of Angel City FC, the new women's pro soccer team in Los Angeles that will start play in spring 2022. Julie is a former captain of the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team, where she played from 1987 to 2004, winning two World Cup titles and two Olympic gold medals. Today, she's a broadcaster at ESPN and one of ESPNW's primary voices, including hosting the hit podcast, Laughter Permitted with Julie Fowdy. Angela Ruggiero is the co-founder and CEO of Sports Innovation Lab. That's a technology-powered market research firm empowering industry-leading sports brands to identify the trends, products, and services that will fuel the future of sports. Angela is a member of the Hockey Hall of Fame, having appeared in four Olympics and winning one gold medal during her hockey career from 1996 to 2011. She's held several leadership positions at the highest levels of sport, including the executive board of the International Olympic Committee 
and Chief Strategy Officer of the 2028 LA Olympics bid. And Alicia Ocasio recently completed her first season playing pro softball in a new league created by Athletes Unlimited. This continued a stellar career in which she's also played for national pro fast pitch, the Puerto Rican national team, and the University of Florida, where she won an NCAA national title in 2015. Alicia is a vocal presence on issues of social justice. She works with other athletes, including her wife, WNBA player Natasha Cloud, on More Than a Vote, which is an initiative to fight systemic racism. So Julie, Angela, and Alicia, welcome. If we can call you up here onto the screen now. Hello. Hello. Thank you all. Thank for you. <laughs> so let, let's start with the premise of this conversation. More women in power in sports, right? I want each of you to sort of briefly imagine we have a world where there are more women as sports owners, um, more women in C-suite executive positions on teams, leagues, and media companies. What do you think would be different about sports? Angela, do you want to start first? Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, I don't think that future is too far away. We've got a, an, an investor owner on this call here with, with Julie. Um, we're seeing a, a, a monumental shift, I think, just uh, in general towards more equity in society. And I think that there, there's a big opportunity now, I think, for the sports industry to really wrap our arms around that and, and truly be more inclusive. So uh, I think it's not a fairy tale to say this this isn't going to happen. I believe this is, it's currently happening. And, you know, sometimes it takes a woman to know what women want. Um, you know, that's why at the work we do at Sports Innovation Lab is all about really understanding your fan base. And for, for decades, if not centuries, sports has been built off of a very male model um, by men for men. And with this massive societal change that's been spurred by technology, and I'll get into that later, uh, voices are elevating. All voices are elevating. Fans' voices are elevating. And they're demanding something different than what they have. Uh, you know, I think about the long tail. Historically, we've built a model of sports around one, one way of doing business. You mentioned this, John, uh, that COVID has completely shifted that. Uh, so therein lies, I think, the opportunity for women's sports to rethink how we do business to, in some ways, and quite frankly, do it better. Um, and I'd love to get into this topic because sports as a whole is uh, absolutely shifting. The fan is shifting. Technology is shifting. It's a moment in time that we've literally never had in the sports industry to do things better, differently. And I, that's why I believe the time is now for women. Um, so we can get into what it'll look like, but I, I just wanted to start with uh, society has changed, technology has changed, the business of sports is absolutely changing now. And, uh, and, and it's a really exciting time for women's sports to bubble up and for more women, quite frankly, to get involved in that. And again, takes a woman to, to know what women want. So we need more women at the table. <laughs> absolutely. And we, I do want to get into that some more about um, the work that you're doing. Alicia, just, you know, a briefly high level view, what, what would be different if women were more in charge of, of professional sports? Well, if women were in charge of more professional sports, I don't know that I'd be here with you guys today um, having this conversation. But um, with women in, in these positions, we have more opportunities, um, more visibility, more coverage, and a more equitable playing field. Um, as Angela said, sports are built by men for men. And with women in these positions, it'd be totally different. And um, we'd have women betting on women in a more equitable playing field. Amen. I'll, I'll add to that. You don't even have to cue me up on that. I, I would say everything would be different, John. Absolutely. I think one of the things we as, as female athletes across the board, it doesn't matter which sport, but the thing that you hear when you talk to female athletes and still to this day, sadly, is it, we're often an afterthought right? With the group that is running the organization, whether it be a league, a national team, a federation. Um, and it's secondary in terms of no one wakes up at that uh, business or place or league in, in a large sense and says, okay, how am I going to make it better for these women today? 
And I think that's the biggest difference I'm noticing. And we'll get into this, of course, a lot more, but it's just a shift of mindset. Instead of just surviving, it's a thriving mentality. We're not here just to survive. We're here to thrive. And that's very different. I'm, it's very noticeable at Angel City. And we'll talk about that. Um, but that shift is a much needed and wonderful one. And I think um, we are there, we're, as Angela pointed out, we're getting there. Not fully there, of course, but we are getting there. Yeah, but along those lines, I mean, Alicia, I'd love to hear from you about what, what's changed with today's women athletes, right? So Angela and Julie played in a time where there was some progress in women's sports, but I think to Julie's point, a lot more was you should feel fortunate to have what you have. But it seems like today that is markedly different and women athletes are demanding more. What What is changing? Um, you know, I can speak on a little bit of that shift that Angela and Julie uh, spoke about. Um, as an athlete myself, I feel like we've been conditioned to be thankful for everything that we have. And while I am extremely thankful, I feel like our generation wants more. And we're speaking about it. I feel like we've seen a lot more media coverage uh, for women. Um, there's actually media outlets that are dedicated to speaking on these athletes and, and issues that we face. Um, but I think the biggest thing is, is knowing our worth and going after what we deserve. Um, so with me and, and my colleagues, that's been a lot of the conversation. And, and I feel like with Athletes Unlimited, um, the organization has, has given us, I feel like more so what we deserve and, and what I've, I've experienced. So Angela, let, let's talk about worth because you're working on this project right now called the Fan Project where you're using data to analyze women's sports. What does this project entail? What do you what do you hope to show? And are there any any early findings you can share with us? Sure. The FAM project is a um, a data driven approach. Uh, we're going to write a research report at Sports Innovation Lab around the business opportunity for women's sports about and really what to do a, a strategic roadmap for the women's sports industry. I mean, the three of us have probably been on too many calls, too many podcasts, too many of these where we're talking about. We should, we could. There, and and I said, you know what? I can't do this again, even though I'm here today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, if I could accelerate change by giving data and and talk in the language of business, which is money, that I think will really accelerate um, the, this industry. Which again, it, maybe they don't feel it with their heart, and that's fine. But if you can talk dollars and cents and say there's there's you're leaving money on the table because you're there's a market out there, a massive market that's been undervalued, underserved, misunderstood. So the fan project is about um, looking at fan data. So I would encourage everyone here to go on to fanproject.co. Uh, we want ba basically your social media history. We'll anonymize it um, and look at it in aggregate and say, look, there's, we've been ranking women's sports based on Nielsen ratings. And we all know the statistic of 4%. Well, we're in a chicken and the egg conundrum. Well, oh, people don't watch women's sports. We're not on TV, no kidding. <laughs> but there are avid fans out there. And we all know this, that are on social media, that are digitally savvy, that are on finding you know content on Twitch. These, these fluid fans, as we call them, women's sports fans are, are, are avid. They're, they are, and they're, they're the future fan to be quite honest. Um, so the fan project is basically saying, let's not look at Nielsen alone. Yes, we should incorporate viewership numbers because that's important, but we historically as an industry, women's sports have gotten dinged because we don't have the same reach as the men. We don't have the same volume um, tonnage as they say. So we should rethink, no, fan engagement looks very different today than it did 10 years ago. It includes what you're doing on social media. What are you liking? What are the apps you're downloading? What do you, what do you do? Are you buying an orange hoodie? That doesn't get counted when you buy the w, you know, WNBA hoodie. That, that sits in another CRM system. So we're saying, can we aggregate all these other forms of fan engagement through the fan project and give you a better look at the behaviors of fans and say, you're missing the boat here, sports industry. There's a lot of data that say there's a market out there. And again, if you keep looking at the 4% on Nielsen, you're just going to keep getting the same number. Um, and hopefully that'll shift through time. So the fan project is about, you know, smacking the industry around saying, got to move faster. Here's the data to prove it. 
you're measuring the wrong things. There's a market, a hungry, avid, digitally savvy market. Let us show you who they are. So we're asking fans to do good with their data and, you know, let us analyze their behavior, which I think will speak to everything that this conversation will be about. That's interesting. And then what, there will be a report that will come out or what, what will you do then with this data ultimately? Yeah, we'll write a report. Uh, it'll come out in June. Uh, and like I said, it'll not just be here's the, the underserved market that you haven't been able to see, um, but also what to do. We want to provide a, a strategic roadmap for the industry on how to actually move women's sports forward through this new business model. Again, everything I do at Sports Innovation Lab is studying the fluid fan fan behaviors, fan engagement, fans are shifting overnight. The, and COVID exposed just how fragile the sports industry is in some ways. Yes, we have our traditional media rights, our traditional sponsorship, ticket sales, um, but all these, the, the new revenue opportunities are these new fan behaviors, these new fan engagement streams. That to me is where a lot of your women's sports fans live because they can't view, they can't buy, they can't attend but they are active and they're out there. And again, that's the path to growth for the future. So it's a report, John, um, but really think of it more of a, a strategic roadmap of, of, of the how. Oh, that's interesting. Looking forward to seeing that. So it comes out yeah. in June. Um, Julie, I mean, look, there are many cases, women's sports seem to be doing more with less. I know we don't wanna always just look at TV ratings and Nielsen viewership, but if you look over the past year during COVID, TV ratings were down across the board for the large majority of men's pro sports leagues. And while men's sports still typically draw far more viewers than women's sports, look at some of the growth for women's sports. Um, NWSL viewership was up 500%. Mm -hmm. WNBA regular season was up 68% and the finals were up 15%. Mm -hmm. uh, the LPGA viewership increased 21%. Uh, NCAA women's basketball final four was up 14% and the highest in nine years. Julie, what, what lessons can be learned from that, this growth? Yeah, I mean, to Angela's point, they're engaging and they're, and they're rabid for information. I, I think there was a, a statistic that came out that NWSL actually led all professional teams in social media engagement during the pandemic for their games. And you also had, I think LaChina Robinson was the one, my ESPN colleague who tweeted during March Madness that, you know, at one point, one night, there was 39 million impressions, social media impressions for the women's games. And uh, it was double what the men's engagement was. And so I do think we are measuring it in the wrong way. Um, and, and that really is one of the things that Angel City, you know, you talk about, as you, you opened up with John, a woman-led group, uh, female uh, majority owned. And what they're thinking about is how do we not only provide brands that support the team, of course, but brands that support our values. And it's very value-based. And so what they're doing is, for example, uh, they are giving back 10% of all sponsorship money to the community, to non-for-profits, to work we can do in the community. When they did their seat deposits, for example, um, they realized one of the biggest barriers to women continuing to play sports and young girls is they don't have a sports bra in underserved communities. And so for every seat deposit, they gave away a sports bra uh, linked in with Nike. And so you have just a thoughtfulness about the value-based agenda behind what we're doing. It's mission and purpose. It's not just, yeah, we're here to win soccer games, of course, and we're here to build a, a successful model, but we're also here to make a difference in our community. I think that is another stark difference with women-led organizations and that they're tying into what matters to fans emotionally, viscerally. And what you're seeing is they're, following they're loving that they're you know they're very brand loyal and i think brands are starting to realize it's a different different model when it's run by women yeah i mean julie it's a it's a phenomenal investor group that you're part of um you know natalie portman jessica chastain eva longoria serena williams abby wambach mia ham the list goes on and on i even saw where eva longoria said she received receives more calls about funding a soccer team than she ever did about her own acting career. 
Um, <laughs> so how, how did this group come together and, and what lessons maybe can be learned about how female led ownership groups could come together like this in pro sports? Well, our Zoom calls are very entertaining. Our ownership Zoom calls, I must, I must admit. Um, it came together, I call her our godmother, our catalyst behind it all, Natalie Portman, because Natalie, bless her soul, heard Abby Wambach speak at a Time's Up event. And Abby was talking about her very different reality as a iconic, legendary female athlete retiring and realizing that hey, I was just at the ESPYs receiving this award next to Peyton Manning and Kobe Bryant. And their retirement reality was very different than mine. And so Abby's telling this story and Natalie is thinking, well, why can't we change that? Why can't we change this model so that it's different for women? And we're thinking more intentionally about their careers. And obviously that's not going to happen overnight. But the beautiful thing about Natalie Portman is it wasn't just, hey, why can't we change this? It was why can't we change this? And I'm going to actually move on this and do something about it. And so she met with Kara Nortman, who's one of our original founding owners, awesome uh, venture capitalists in that space. And, um, and then they brought on Julie Ehrman, who's now our president and one of our founding owners as well. And those three went out and pitched this model. And Natalie got all her friends from Hollywood to join in. And when they came to me uh, and Mia, we said, well, this seems like something we should get all our friends involved in as well. So we had 14 of us from the U.S. Women's National Team with ties to Los Angeles. I'll jump in, of course, as well. Um, and then when you have those types of groups behind something like that, it's obviously easy at a tipping point to, to bring others in because they want to be involved with such a great group. But really, it was Natalie having the vision to say, I want to change this model because I think this is an untapped resource that has a ton of upside and a ton of potential. And then you get investors like Alexis Sohanian, uh, bless him, and Serena Williams, who obviously understand that. So, so Julie, the, the US has struck out a couple of times in the past, trying to get a sustainable <laughs> women's- John, why program. do you have to do that to me? Why do you have to go there? <laughs> what, what, what are the lessons you've learned from past attempts? And, and do you think this time will be any different? Uh, lessons learned is that it's hard, of course, to, to run a women's professional league. I think this time will be very different. It's a different model in terms of you have U.S. soccer as well, who from the, the very beginning of NWSL, now in their ninth season, was on board in the first two leagues. They didn't have that partnership with U.S. soccer, um, so it was difficult. I think you have a model that um, is just really at this wonderful starting point, even though it's in its ninth year, you're seeing this traction and this movement and this interest and energy around uh, this league. And people are starting to finally realize the potential of it. So I think um, the first two iterations of a women's professional soccer league, we learned a ton in terms of uh, management and spending and um, how to make sure that we are doing things efficiently and smartly. And I think all those things have played into the success of this third league. Um, but I do feel like it's, it's, it's very different with this third iteration. And especially now when you're seeing, you know, some of the new teams that are coming in and, and the owners that are coming with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Alicia, I want to talk a little bit about uh, new competition formats that we're seeing with women's sports because you're part of a really unique model with Athletes Unlimited for women's pro softball. They've also created leagues for lacrosse and volleyball. There's redrafting of players each week. Uh, points are awarded almost sort of like fantasy uh, sports style scoring based on team and individual performance. Um, you've got players involved in creating the playing rules, right? And the marketing strategies and the racial equity committee, committee work. So what was that like for players to have that kind of ownership of a, of a team and, and even a league, really? Yeah, I think Athletes Unlimited is very unique. Um, we have a very innovative scoring system that some people might look at as unorthodox. Actually, everyone would because it's obviously not traditional, um, which was, you know, really cool. Um, at first, I was a little bit skeptical about it, but, you know, in, in playing it and, and, you know, experience it firsthand, I, you know, it, it grew on me because it was just so different. And I, you know, as Angela and Julie, 
you know, mentioned before, like there's a shift in, in women's coverage and there needs to be a shift in, in how we do things in order to, to engage and for people to um, um, connect. So, you know, at Athletes Unlimited, the misconception is that it's all individual based and there's no really, there's no team aspect, which um, I'm here to debunk. Um, so you can get points for team wins. Um, so you'll get points for, you'll get 50 points for team wins, but you can also get points for um, each inning win. So you can still lose a game and break even with your points um, on the team level. Um, so it's really important that, you know, you know, you are, we talked about this before um, the panel that we're still a cohesive as a team and doing little things to make sure that we're all, you know, doing, doing what we can to score, but we can also get points for individual accolades, like getting hits, um, striking people out, um, home runs, different things like that. So the, you know, the scoring system is a lot different, but I think, um, I think that's what we need right now in the softball world. There's such a huge disparity between college softball and pro softball. There hasn't even been a softball league um, in the past few years, aside from Athletes Unlimited. So, um, you know, John and Jonathan, they had a vision um, and they, you know, it came to fruition with this Athletes Unlimited League. And um, I can speak more about it later, but, um, you know, I think it's first season, I, you know, it, it, it's here to stay because I think it was just such a great thing for our sport. Um, uh, and keeping fans engaged um, in inning in and inning out through the scoring system. Yeah. It was also interesting that you all redrafted players each week. It was like a five week season, all played in one city, you know, one location. Um, what did you learn any lessons about like, who did you draft? I mean, what, what was that like being a player, but you're also in a sense, you're sort of a captain or the coach of the team. Yeah. I think just, um, you know, it, I, talk to my wife Natasha about this a lot that pressure is a privilege I think historically and traditionally um, you'll have coaches who are doing all this for you who are picking the teams who are putting in the position who are making up practice plans but being a captain you know that's all in your hands and as much as you want it to be uh, because we do have facilitators who will help us throughout the process um, but as a captain um, I you know I came up with practice plans I would consult with the facilitators and some of the vets in our league as well on my team um, but it's just really taking ownership of, of what's right in front of you. And, and it's a lot of responsibility. Some people kind of delegated that responsibility to other teammates or their facilitators, but, um, it was really cool. It's a player run league. Um, so we, we got a say in, in pretty much everything that was going on within um, our team and in the league as a whole. So, um, it was, is different, but, um, as I mentioned before, pressure is a privilege and it was really cool to have ownership over, um, my team in those moments as a captain. That's interesting. A Angela, you were on the advisor group, you know, for Athletes Unlimited. You helped brainstorm this model. They, they got some, some good pickup um, early on. They've been broadcast or streamed by ESPN, CBS Sports, Fox Sports. Um, there are sponsors like Nike, Geico, and, and Gatorade. Um, I know players earned between about $10,000 and $40,000 over the five-week season. What are your thoughts on whether this model can work and, and what women's sports or even, you know, men's sports as well could take from this model? Well, I'm obviously biased. Um, we worked, um, my company worked with John and Jonathan uh, literally on a whiteboard to create the, to create the league. Uh, and it was based on our research, uh, which again, I love, which is sports is, sports is changing overnight. And they saw that, that fans, fluid fans follow individuals. That's again, I think a big reason why you have the, the scoring system that fluid fans follow values. The new age consumer wants to align with a brand that represents and looks like who they are. Uh, fluid fans are digitally savvy. That's why you know they've done a great job getting on different platforms, not just linear broadcast. So the league itself was structured in a way that was forward thinking, future thinking. And the fact that it empowers women, gives the rights to the athletes to you know, have a maternity policy or uh, play in another league. It's always meant to be a shoulder league, not the, the standalone league. It's supplemental income. It's supplemental visibility. Um, but it, I think, is, is laying the foundation for, for experimentation and what's possible in sports. Um, so I'm, I'm, I love that Alicia had a great experience. I love that other athletes are saying, let's come back for season two and that more sports will be included. Um, you know, it's just, again, this panel is about 
let's do things differently. A AU is an example of that. And um, I would like to address why we haven't switched things. Um, I, a lot of our research is around this industry has been very um, secure for decades. Rights fees are locked up, long-term deals, sponsorship. Julie's point before that women's sports is always an afterthought. We're, the entire sports ecosystem is rethinking how we do business. And um, if you, and I wonder why we're not where we're at. Um, I'd love a, a conversation around the implicit bias in the system. If you Google, we did this, who are the top, who are the um, most popular NCAA basketball players? Google actually has a default that looks for men. So they list 10 male basketball players. But if you look at the number of followers, you have more women on that list. If you think about venture funding and Julie's group, 2% of venture funding goes to women found companies. We like to invest in people that look like ourselves. So in therein lies, again, implicit bias in the funding that goes into women's sports, women's products, women's healthcare. I, I sat on the board of the IOC and initiated the gender equality project. I was dumbfounded. Why? Why can't women's hockey be the last event at the Winter Olympics or women's marathon? Why is it always the men's marathon or men's hockey? Why can't we switch up scheduling? That impacts viewership. Why are there differences in equipment? Why are there differences in bonuses that you see at the federation level? Why, why, why? We should be asking these sorts of questions to really unlock the implicit bias in all the ways that men's sports have been funded for decades. Men's sports have been visible. There's a why behind this. And again, the, the encouraging, I'll start, I'll just stop with, it's encouraging because people are asking those questions and you have groups like Natalie Portman's group and Julie, they're saying, okay, we can change that. We can get women, we can invest in women. And again, it's that, that awareness that I think that'll really push like, Hmm, you're right. I guess we could alternate men's and women's marathon. That would be more equitable. Um, and, you know, just take someone asking the question. It's amazing too how much just one example like at Angel City and what we've done. And and granted, I understand it's a, it's an list Hollywood celebrity laden group, which is um, in and of itself a hard one to come about. But it's a roadmap for others. To to your point, and just now there's so many people immediately after Angel City was announced. I cannot tell you how many calls I got from friends in New York City friends in Chicago, friends in Northern California, friends in Washington, DC saying, holy hell, we could totally do this. <laughs> we could do this. And then you're seeing now, of course, as you mentioned off the top, John, Chicago Red Stars, for example, and NWSL, a huge new ownership group that included, you know, ESPN colleague, Sarah Spain, NFL stars, NBA players, tech people, all these different wonderful silos coming mm -hmm. together to build that are all from the Chicago market. You're seeing that in DC, as you said, uh, Chelsea Clinton, Jenna Bush joining that with Dominique Dawes and Brian Escurry. I mean, this diversity and these different silos that are coming together is fascinating, but it took, you know, a little bit of a nudge to say, hey, this is doable in your market as well, let's go. And, and I do think it can offer a roadmap, not just for soccer, of course, but for other sports leagues as well. Yeah, it's, it's also really interesting. We're seeing women take more ownership of the stories that are being told mm -hmm. for women's sports. Um, so for instance, Alex Morgan, Sue Bird, Simone Manuel, Chloe Kim, all, you know, elite star athletes, they started a new media and commerce company. They're gonna be creating original content for social media platforms, form licensing deals, sell merchandising. And who is their key audience? It's girls and young women you know, interested in sports, as well as focusing on topics like activism, culture, wellness, beauty. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alicia, I wonder you know, what you think about something like this from active athletes taking more ownership of it, and will we see more of this? Absolutely. Um, I think it's really important that we have platforms like this out there. Um, too often, I feel like people try to tell our stories for us. Um, so in creating this, this platform and this organization to be able to have our narratives be, be told to young women and, and, you know, even, you know, young boys um, and non-binary people, um, it's really important to be able to see people who look like them, to be able to look up to, to know that anything is possible, that other people go through things that they might go through as well um, and anything's possible. So um, 
you know, I've seen, you know, we talk about this shift. I've seen so many media platforms that are now um, changing the narrative and telling stories. I mean, I think that's one thing that's, you know, so awesome about Athletes Unlimited as well is the storytelling that, um, that our content team has done. And it's been a lead and been pivotal in, in the growth of, of um, our league. But with, you know, together, I think it's an awesome, an awesome thing that they're doing and putting together. And I've already seen some great pieces, so. John, just to, to add one quick thing in there, and Ange will understand this, I'm sure, us old bags. Uh, when you go back to our time, right, we would be like, hey, could you, you know, couldn't we do more merchandising? We'd say to the Federation, for example, U.S. Soccer Federation, shouldn't we be doing more around this or this or this? And they'd be like, no, nah, it's not going to sell. It's not going to sell. It's not, you know, no, the market's not there. Um, fan base engagement isn't there, right? Well, the current U.S. women's soccer team, when they would say that to U.S. soccer, and here's the difference to, to Alicia's point, they, they would say, hey, you know, we want to do more merchandising. And instead of waiting for U.S. soccer or Nike or whoever it is, they basically said, oh, mm -hmm. hell no, I'm going to do it myself. I had a great conversation with Alex Morgan a couple years back where she was like, yeah, they kept telling us no, U.S. soccer. And so we were like, OK, we're going to do our own shirts. We'll start our own business. And then they go and crush it. I mean, she said, like, we sold a million pieces in the first year or something ridiculous. And, and so that's the difference. Back in our day, we would have been like, wait, we kept knocking and rattling and shaking. But we wouldn't, at least we didn't have the foresight back then to say, well, why don't we just do this ourselves? Let's own this. But it's an interesting trend, again, um, that athletes historically have had this barrier. This is across all sports. It's athlete, agent to the consumer, it's athlete, national governing body to the consumer, it's athlete sponsor to the, you know, there's this barrier. We're, we're direct to consumer now. We are, athletes have completely shifted in power. If, if Alicia wants to say something, she gets on Twitter and overnight her voice is out there, which is great. So there's a massive dynamic empowered, uh, athletes across the board are empowered by technology now. They have a voice, they can spin up a company, they can you even just look at volume of followers, volume of, you know, the channel is the athlete now, not necessarily the league or the team. So with that dynamic, I think, again, women's sports has a massive opportunity to be that the athletes themselves are the influencers, are the platform, are the, the influencers that ultimately are, are, you know, to Julie's point, may not need the Federation, may not, maybe they need the logo, but they can get around that, I guess. Um, <laughs> But there's their athletes are getting creative. And, and I think women tend to be more vulnerable, open. There's a whole market that is hungry for the, that kind of influencer. Whereas the men typically use their channels and they're talking about their statistics or so there's a, again, I think a massive shift in society enabled by technology that's giving athletes a voice and women's athletes are leaning into it hard and you see the, 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 the amplification and, and, and the results. And I think again, why women's sports has a, a really positive future ahead of it. Yeah. Julie, I want to ask you then, we're going to do one more question here. We want to get to audience Q and A. And again, if you have a question for the panelists, put it into the Q and A function of the zoom. Um, Julie, there are some media outlets doing a good job of covering women's sports. Um, ESPNW is one that you're very familiar with. There's a website called just women's sports that another. Um, that's another. I wonder, has the idea of creating these separate silos for women's sports coverage proven to be a benefit for women's sports, or has it made it more difficult for the average sports fan to find women's sports? It's a tough one. It's a great question. Um, I, one I grapple with a, a lot, right, with um, ESPNW as well. Um, I, I think that that what you're seeing is in, in just women's sports, for example, Haley Rosen started that Stanford soccer player. Yes, Haley. Mm -hmm. um, basically she said, and I remember talking to her in the early stages, like, look, there's just not enough out there and I'm tired of it. And we can, we can change this model. Um, and, you know, just what we were talking about before, whatever the business is, you're now seeing women step into this space. ATA, which does a lot of streaming of women's soccer matches, for example, um, started by a woman who said, this is ridiculous that we can't find a lot of these international matches and leagues and, um, and people want to consume it. So I, I think there's a purpose for it, 
similar to what Billie Jean King says about the Women's Sports Foundation, hopefully one day we won't need a Women's Sports Foundation, she says, mm -hmm. right? And that there will be uh, equality and inclusion and equal pay across play across the field for these women. And I won't have to be uh, you know, involved in a foundation that really continues to advocate for that. Um, but we're not there yet. And so I think, you know, I welcome into the space anyone that says, hey, let's let's present something that's completely different than what we're seeing on linear um, and figure out a way to tap into that market. Uh, because as as we've said this whole panel, right? There is, and it's the argument we give we gave to US soccer for so many years. I don't care where you fall on your love hate of women's sports. <laughs> the reality is there is an entire untapped potential there that has a lot of dollar signs behind it. And that actually makes made them pay attention. And so, and that's what I'm hoping is um, the future for women's sports with a lot of women saying, we can do this and we're gonna show you how to do it. And we're gonna lead the way in this way. Yeah. Well, listen, we wanna, we wanna take some audience questions now. Again, if to submit a question, you can uh, write into the Q and A function on Zoom. Now I want to um, introduce now Kendall Baker. He's sports editor of Axio Sports and he's gonna uh, moderate this portion of the discussion. Kendall. Thanks, John. This is great so far. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I'm going to start with what seems to be the most popular submitted question. A lot of, a lot of folks basically asking what, what can we do to help? What, what calls to action do the panelists have for fans, for everyday inv individuals to support at the grassroots level? As, as Deirdre says, tell us who to call. Where do we make demands? We'll do it. Like, what do you give direction wise in terms of how fans and everyday individuals can, can help at the grassroots level? Well, I mean, I would, I would say help, help our cause <laughs> the fan co we're trying to again, get fans to help us see literally their fandom measure their fandom and express that, that interest, that, that, uh, that fan engagement to the industry. So that, that would be one easy way to help me and, and, what our group of partners at, in it, and we're writing a report for the WNBA for the national women's soccer league. They're all our partners, WWE, UFC. Uh, we've got LPGA. We've got a lot of great groups on there. I want to make it easy for them to go to sponsors, for them to go to media and say, look, here's the business case. I'd say, talk to your um, government representative, title nine. Where if this is an, a, a, an American conversation here in particular, Title IX, we have to continue to support. We talked about, I saw a comment in the chat around schedules or uniforms or funding. We need to make sure at all levels, if it's a government supported initiative that again, you're advocating, support groups like the Women's Sports Foundation uh, that, that are advocating on a daily basis, that are raising money on a daily basis and supporting uh, women's sports in particular, watch. Show up and watch. I mean, when Julie's calling a game, tune in, make it a point. I know it's hard to find, we're, but we're diehards. So, so make sure you're watching, you're tweeting, you're liking, you're, you're buying. Buy a season ticket last season or two seasons ago, because last season got canceled, two seasons ago now. I bought season tickets for Harvard women's hockey. I was a Harvard hockey player. Could I go to all the games? No, I have kids and I'm busy. I gave the tickets away. I could, I attended the games I could do, but the fact that I bought a season ticket, again, buy season tickets to your national women's soccer league and give them away. If you can't attend, spend money. We need people to spend money. So again, I, I would love you to help me, but uh, in, in the fan project, I'm trying to use data, but there are a myriad of ways you all can get involved. And again, uh, and, and show your support, uh, be vocal at the end of the day. It's, we need everyone. Yeah. And, and show the brands that support women in sports the love, right? I mean, it is amazing when Budweiser came on as the, the national NWSL sponsor, the amount of fan engagement of people holding up their Budweiser's, drinking Budweiser's, everyone was going out buying uh, different Budweiser products. And so I do think that type of engagement is seen by the sponsors and those companies, but support them for getting in there and saying, hey, this matters to us. Um, and so, I, I, and, and I echo, you know, Ange with engagement, seats, butts and seats helps, obviously, of course, buying uh, season tickets, all those things. Um, great, and, and so next question, moving on, maybe we'll start with you, Alicia. It's, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about 
uh, sports d different models here. And, and another question asked by multiple folks was basically, um, how do we address women's interests in terms of gender separate structures of sports versus not? So basically the WNBA model attaching to an existing league like the, uh, the NBA or these kind of standalone leagues that we're seeing, you know, pop up more, more commonly. Can, can you kind of speak to those two separate models and, and maybe how that points to the future or, or, you know, where we go from here? Yeah, I'm no professional like Angelie and Julie with this stuff, but um, from experience, I know that my life and my leagues would be a lot different if we were to have the MLB um, as a, a big brother to help us out as the WNBA has the NBA. Um, I know for a while and speaking with my wife, Natasha, that the WNBA, they weren't able to stand alone without the NBA's help at a certain point. And, and now she feels comfortable and confident in saying that they are able to now um, in, in comparison to leagues that do it themselves, which I feel like nowadays is you know, kind of what we have to do in order to be seen, to, to flourish, to, to get what we need done and be seen and, and to be able to play. Um, so, you know, we talked a, a lot about it earlier, more so Angela and, and Julie about kind of just, you know, if, if you're not gonna help us, we gotta do it ourselves. And I feel like that's what Athletes Unlimited is doing. Um, and, and, you know, we have John and Jonathan investing and we have the whole operations crew just working hard day in and day out to making sure that our women's league is on that same playing field as the men's leagues. Um, but I feel like it would, it would, you know, baseball players don't even have salary caps. What is it to, to write off a, a player's salary to, to help our women's leagues grow? What is it to, to, to donate, to help the women's in sports foundation to, to just, you know, support these grassroots organizations so that we have more equitable playing field. Um, so, uh, you know, there's differences, but, you know, I feel like we have to kind of at this point do it ourselves. And, and passing it off to Julia and Angela, I'm curious if you have any thoughts just in terms of, as Alicia was saying, that it seems, you know, in, in many examples, and, and Angela, women's hockey, women's pro hockey kind of had this debate in, in, you know, last year a lot, which is basically, you know, do we go the WNBA model? Do we, do we partner with the NHL or do we do this ourselves? And it does seem like that is maybe a, a, a growing conversation in terms of when do you start talking about that? Because it does seem like, you know, having the men's leagues help in the, in the beginning is, is obviously necessary in many cases, but is, is there more conversation around making that transition or, or is it also just that there's more opportunities to start from day one as an independent kind of standalone league? Yeah, I mean, um, it's an interesting question. Do you need a men's league to be successful? Men's league have, have had hist you know, decades, centuries, millions and billions of dollars invested. So it makes sense they have the infrastructure in place, the shared services in, in place to support a women's league. Um, but I, I don't think you have to. I think it, the, the best case is there is some uh, brotherly love, um, shared services, but you, you know, I don't necessarily think you, you women's sports now has to have a male arm. Now I look at the Olympics, you have all men's, women's, all countries under one umbrella, of course, hosting that event, hosting a, a Wimbledon, we have men's and women's under the same umbrella. Those all make sense. You, you, they're treated equally though, under one brand. And so if you can, if the NHL were to say, we're going to treat a women's league equally and the same thing with the W the NBA were to say, I'm going to treat the W equally. Then I would say, hell yeah, let's go. But what Julie said before, are you going to lift it and shift it, shrink it and pink it and underfund it? And you expect it to be successful. It's not going to work. So I am, I'm, I, you know, I think it's great to have women um, men's leagues to, you know, utilize their infrastructure uh, and, and, uh, the resources that they currently have, but, um, I'd like to think we're in an era where you don't need it. Um, it, it and unless it was again, uh, one plus one equals three, where think about Wimbledon, where they've said, Hey, we're going to have equal prize money. We're going to have equal infrastructure. We're going to have equal branding, equal court time. I mean, that's at the IOC. We, we, we we're slowly moving in that direction. Almost 50% of the athletes will be female. Um, so, 
it's a tricky question um, to get there quicker. Yeah. It'd be great to have to, to walk into a, a system, but I wouldn't ever want to be in a, a system where you're the, you know, the ugly stepchild that doesn't get treated the same way. <laughs> great. Um, another question that uh, multiple people asked, we talked a little, we talked about uh, more female uh, leadership and ownership at the, at the C-suite level. Uh, a few folks asked about how do we leverage the momentum and energy here to impact the future of female coaches and how to get more women into coaching at the recreational collegiate and pro leagues and how might that impact girls participation in sports uh julie mm -hmm. you want to take that one off yeah i think it'll be huge i mean we know that uh, you know so much of a, a person's first experience dictates whether they stay with the sport or not for a young kid right and um, and it's often a luck of the draw type of situation where it's a volunteer coach, often, you know, a, a dad, um, and bless his soul, but maybe it's not, you know, the most positive environment that, uh, a kid can get into. And so I think we absolutely have to do a better job of building out that pipeline. I mean, one of the things I've noticed with, uh, the soccer community is that, um, they're starting finally to make it easier for women to actually attend coaching seminars, coaching licensing courses, courses. And I mean, for, for a long time, it's been this low hanging fruit that we should have been able to, to recognize like, Hey, it's really hard. It's really expensive. It's really time consuming for a woman to go through this coaching license, license courses and, and all the steps it takes to get there. And oh, by the way, they're like the only woman there with, you know, 500 men. And that's kind of weird. Like, and as players, why aren't we being offered the ability to get our license? And so now you're seeing, for example, national team players can get their license while playing on the national team. NWSL professional players can get their license while playing. And so we're doing a better job of planting that seed. No one ever came to me when I was a player and said, hey, do you want to think about this? Do you want to think about the possibility of coaching as a career and, and getting your license? Because here's this, you know, that's available to you um, that we're going to help you go down this path. And, and, and that, you know, doesn't just apply to coaching. I think one of the things that's nice to see at Angel City is one, one of the, the things we constantly talk about is um, obviously player well-being, retirement funds for players, right? Uh, creating uh, seminars and educational classes and opportunities for them to think beyond just, you know, what it looks like to be a professional soccer player. What if you want to be a GM? What if you wanted to get into a d different industry? How do you do that? Um, and having those conversations while they're playing. And so I think the same goes with coaching and we're starting to get there, but boy, is it really late. And as a result, you're seeing, there's just not a lot of women out there coaching. And I think really could be a gift if we start adding more women into that equation. Awesome. Um, and this is for all three of you, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll probably end on this. Um, the 50th anniversary of Title IX is a year away. So dream big. What would you want to see for the next 50 years as we build on that? Any, any of you three can start that one. Dream big. As a softball player, <laughs> um, we weren't granted um, full team scholarships. Um, softball wasn't considered a revenue sport. It is now recently, and the NCAA has been considered a revenue sport. So I would like to see equality as far as scholarships. I mean, from experience, I had to scratch for pennies as a, as a college athlete, and I'm sure a lot of people can have had the same experience. But um, just, uh, you know, equal opportunities as far as that goes. Um, you know, we're more than, more than qualified. So I would love to see, um, you know, the needle pushed a lot further so that we're on the same playing field. Angela or Judy? Really? Um, I would love to see an environment where, you know, you're not, flipping into social media and seeing that there's two dumbbells and one yoga mat, right? <laughs> and that, oh, we didn't have the space. And um, and you look and, and see in 2021, the corresponding you know facilities for the men. I would love to see a situation where we're not still having to say, you who we're here. Um, and 
I would love to see a situation where girls are playing professionally and young women are playing professionally in all sports. And whether it's linked with a, a men's league to help them get the, off the ground or they're doing it independently, they're doing it, right? And, and they're loving it. And a young girl or a young boy has the opportunity in every sport to watch um, these women role models and their markets and be able to go to a game. Um, I would love for us to have to stop suing people for equal pay and actually just get equal pay. Uh, I, I, how many, how many days do we have? I'll keep going. <laughs> um, I, and I do think, I mean, to end on a positive, I do think that we we're we're making great strides. We are, uh, but gosh, there's so much more we have to do. And the fact that we constantly have to remind people that we shouldn't be an afterthought is what gets most frustrating. And, I, and that's what I want to be done with. I don't want to have to keep doing that. It's tiring, and exhausting, and it's just simply unnecessary and silly. I would say, I mean, echo everything. Uh, the government around the world funds their women's youth sports equally to their men's funds their, if they have collegiate sports like we do here, funds them equally. If they have Olympic sports, funds them equally. If you're a federation that you fund them equally. Money, money, money. I want money to be equally flowing because that changes everything uh, in, in terms of, of the opportunity. And that we have women's sports, we have pro sports, uh, that the best players in the world can play till they're 40 and not retire early because they need to get a job that my son, my two sons grow up not knowing the difference between men's and women's sports, that maybe, maybe they prefer women's sports because the fan experience is so much better. To, to me, that 50 years is, is a long time, but I think it's possible to, to get to a point where we equally value sport as a platform to teach about life. That To me, that's why I love sport. It's about all the intangibles you learn the teamwork, the determination. The, and if we have a society recognizes that's what we're giving to our children, we should be giving it to boys. We should be giving it to girls and, and, and we should fund those equally so that again, the money flows, the investment flows, you know, to Julie's point, it's in the pro side now. And that then we don't see gender. We're, we're having this conversation, Kendall, in 50 years and, you know, I won't be around, but, uh, <laughs> but that my boys are like, all right. Uh, that was great. You know, I'm, I'm, do I go to a women's game or a men's game? They all look the same and they're, you know, we're, we're not having this conversation. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, <clears throat> thank you three so much. This is, this is really fantastic. I'm going to flip it back to John for uh, some closing remarks. Yeah. Thank you, Kendall. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Angela and Julie and Alicia. Terrific conversation. A lot to think about. Um, that's all for our event. We really appreciate you all joining. Uh, thank you to our Aspen team, uh, Tom, Fumi, Marty, Emily, and Jennifer. Uh, thank you to Axios, our Future of Sports Media partner. And we encourage you to sign up for Axios's daily sports newsletter at sports.axios.com. Uh, our next Future of Sports conversation will be in the next couple months. Uh, stay tuned for more information on that with the exact date and the topic. Uh, look for a follow-up email from us in the near future with a replay of this discussion and a recap story. And you can also watch the replay now at as.pn backslash women's pro sports. Uh, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter at, at Aspen in sports. And you can also sign up for our monthly sports and society program newsletter by going to as.pn backslash pp subscribe. Uh, this will get you information on the work we do, not only with future sports, but also in youth and high school sports through our Project Play initiative. So until next time, uh, take care and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you.